Hey, deserving listeners. Today, we're going to talk about teen sexuality. And Colin Miller, who is a frequent guest on the podcast, suggested this topic and has an outline. So I'll hand over the mic controls to him. Uh, but before we do that, let's introduce the podcast. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. My name is Umberto Casania, and I sell raw fruit bars. Who are you, Colin? Uh, my name is Colin Miller. I live in Dallas, Texas, and I'm a professional cat cuddler. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the notion of virginity and how I think that it can be a very detrimental idea, in a, especially in the mind of a young person who doesn't know where the idea of virginity originated from and has only been sort of given the deified version of it through other people, either older adults in their family or people who go to their church or teachers or anybody really um, who has that narrative ingrained in them. And there, was, there are so many examples in the show of, um, so the show that we're talking about is Sex Education. Season two just dropped on Netflix. It's a British show about young people at this British school. And his, the main character's mom is a sex therapist. And Otis, her son, who attends the school, ends up giving unsolicited, um, well, it's solicited um, eventually, but um, sex advice to his peers. Or he's not uh, a thank professional. Thank you. Although yeah, he gets um, paid, so I guess he is a professional. <laughs> he gets paid, yeah. Um, but there are so many examples of students who feel the pressure to lose their virginity. And just before I move on with this, um, Kirk and Umberto, how much of the show have you guys seen? I've seen the first couple episodes, and I liked it, but it didn't grab me. Maybe one day I'll go back to it. I saw, I believe I saw the whole first season, although now I'm doubting myself. I have not seen the second season. Um, I liked it. I think I liked it a little better than Kirk. It wasn't, it wasn't like my favorite show, but I, I did find it very intriguing. I thought the, the premise was fascinating. But the, thought, the, the thing I found the most interesting about it were the actual conversations they would have about sex. Because that, yeah, that is real stuff that goes through uh, teenagers and young people's minds. Yeah, um, I definitely think that the the candid way that they talk about sex is very helpful. But going back to um, this idea of virginity, I wonder what you guys think of it in terms of something that you must lose. Because I could see the male and female um, characters in the show reacting to it similarly, but sort of differently. So there's this one girl... Um, I believe the character's name is Lily and she's very quirky. Um, I don't mean that in a diminishing way. She's, she's got very interesting likes and a very just unique style about her. And she definitely doesn't want to just like use an external image of what a high school girl could be to define her in that sense. I think she's a really great character. But one of the things that she does feel is that she just wants to get the sex over with. She's not really in touch with her sexuality. She's not really attracted to Otis, the main character. But nevertheless, because she logically identifies him as safe boy with a penis, um, let me, uh, you know, she wants him basically to have sex with her so that she can just not be a virgin anymore. It turns out not to go super well. And she ends up having um, this sort of pain. I, I wish I would have written down exactly what it's called, but basically when a certain, um, it's due to um, her own anxieties about sex, oh. but she feels an intense pain whenever she inserts like a dildo or a yeah. finger into her vagina. Vaginismus, I think is the... Uh... Yeah, it is a specific thing. So anyway, I wanted to know what you guys think because so she deals with it that way. And then the male characters, it's a little different. It's sort of like you don't have um, manhood if you're a young person and you don't sleep with somebody. Um, and if you are a virgin, it puts you in this classification of like you're somehow less masculine or you don't matter as much and you should be ignored by women. And um, yeah, what are your what are your thoughts on that? Man, I'll start by saying that I actually had a, a girlfriend in college uh, that had that condition, the vaginismus thing. So oh. uh, this, she was a virgin. Um, I believe she had only done like prior to us dating, it was like someone had uh, pleasured her manually, but not really inside, more like on the outside, stuff like that. You know what I mean? I had, I was no longer a virgin at that time, but anyways, but I didn't have like a ton of experience. So 
it was supremely frustrating for the both of us. Neither of us had any idea because it's not like we knew, oh, you might have bad genesis. It wasn't like that. It was like we, we got increasingly physical. In the States or Columbia? In the States. We got increasingly physical. And then when we basically started trying to have sex, it didn't work. Like yeah. I try to like go in and I'm like, what? I'm, I can't go in. And you know, I'm not like a mile wide or something. So I'm like, okay, what's happening here? Um, and uh, you know, and it caused a lot of stress and, and embarrassment and confusion. Uh, and then eventually she had to go to like a doctor and they, if I remember right, they prescribed her, they, uh, they told her, um, you have to take your clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They prescribed her taking off your clothinitis. Um, no, they actually prescribed her increasing sized dildos. Like they, they oh. started her with a tiny little thin thing. And then over time they. So correct me if I'm wrong, but her. she went to the doctor and the physician actually uh, examined her yeah. and determined, oh, you actually have a condition yes. that requires treatment. And that's what Lily does in season two. Yeah, because it okay because it wasn't a, it wasn't really like something they had to do surgery or something. It was really something, some anxiety, and uh, you know per, perhaps uh, guilt, religious guilt, other things uh, had her triggered in such a way that all the muscles would like like just not allow penetration basically, mm. and she had to over time work on that. So yeah. Mm. Actually, we talked about this recently on Valentine's Day. Uh, we were talking about, someone wrote in about uh, their uh, anxiety about being a 20-something-year-old cis male mm -hmm. yeah, virgin. And so this will be, you know, some repeat on that. Yeah, as a society in Western societies, and maybe around the world, we have this really, in general, ridiculous notion around virginity that if you're not a virgin, you're not an adult, you're not a man, uh, you can't, uh, you know, you're not good in bed, this kind of thing. Uh, obviously, it's genderized pretty heavily. And it's uh, just this very strange thing. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, and, you know, if you remember from the previous episode, there's questions from this emailer in. He was saying things like, um, will women want to have sex with me because I'm a virgin? Or uh, will women not trust me because I'm a virgin? Yeah. Uh, will I somehow never be able to be good at sex because I waited too long to lose my virginity? There's just this very strange uh, threshold that we had defined societally that we don't really do for other things, you know? Yeah. It's like, but we use the word virgin, by the way, but we don't really think of it that way. Right? <laughs> if you've never had fish and chips before, we might call you a fish and chips virgin, but we're not gonna, <laughs> but you're not gonna think I can't enjoy food or I'm never gonna enjoy fish and chips my mouth is watering thinking about fish and chips now. <laughs> it's more on the level of like, if you've never seen Star Wars episode four, that's like yeah. being a virgin. So it, 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 there's all these associations carried with it that uh, generally has nothing good for our society. There, there's almost nothing good <laughs> about the social construction around virginity that benefits the human race. I'd say the potentially, but not really, because I could already see the counter arguments. The only thing about like, hey, you know, before you're an adult, maybe take it easy on having sex and getting pregnant, you know, but, but, but even that's questionable because it's like, well, there is, there are protections you can take. And Actually, well, that leads into another topic that I'm guessing Colin wants to get to, but we'll skip forward in his, in his outline here, which is that message, although isn't a terrible message, right? Yeah. To tell teenagers, like, be careful. Yeah. But that's usually all it ends up being. Yeah. That they, don't, they don't follow it up. They don't with, follow it. They don't follow it up. Well, and if you do decide to have sex, you oh, know. Oh, you're saying they don't follow it up. I see. Yeah, yeah, they don't follow. They're just like, take it easy, don't have sex, remain a virgin. Right. These, these notions are, uh, one, completely discounting of reality. Yeah. Uh, and also provides no opportunity uh, and shames people for, for trying to get information yep. uh, for, to actually have a conversation about this. And it was very interesting to me and was interesting was that the teachers were more uptight than the parents were because really? I, I would talk with the ninth grade parents and I'd say, so I'm going to be leading the class on sex education. Are there any concerns? Occasionally, like one out of 500 parents would have some kind of mm. 
hang up. But even them, they were willing to work with me because it's like, because they're probably like, phew, thank goodness. Right. So we don't want to deal with that. Right. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I would reassure them that like, you know, there's a lot of talk about safe sex and about waiting yeah. and all this and about decision making. It was the teachers who were uptight about it. I found Whoa. that the teachers to be extremely like repressed oh. and regressive and scared sure. and uptight and unreasonable. And so I'll never forget the, uh, this is like years, you know, maybe the fifth year I was doing yeah. it. And the older kids, the 17 year olds are presenting their, uh, their class, how they're going to teach the younger kids uh -huh. to me and the other teachers. And the kids are going through, you know, all the STIs, the right. HIVs and, and the pictures that scare people and contraception and, you know, pregnancy of, you know, avoidance and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And at the very end, they're like, yeah, and then we're going to talk, we're going to just kind of sit down and we're going to talk about, you know, when you do decide to have sex with someone. Um, you know, how, how do you make that choice? Right. It's usually going to be in a long-term relationship. And, and then this one guy steps forward and cause he's a senior in high school and he's like, I have a, I've had a girlfriend for 18 months yeah. and about, and about six months, nine months into our relationship, uh, we decided to, st we decided to start thinking about having sex with each other. Yeah. And so we waited a few more months and then we had sex and Oh my God. Uh, and I, and I just wanted to <laughs> talk about how we made that decision. You know, it was very, you know, a lot of thought and we even kind of involved our parents a little bit. And I was just like, beautiful one, right. two, wholly conservative. Right. Right. But, uh, but it's like, if there's an example to follow yeah, right. that a parent <clears throat> and a teacher could get behind, it's this kid, yes. right? The teachers were like, oh, no, oh no, Oh, my no. God. You're not talking about that. You can't. Yeah. In fact, scratch the whole module. Don't even talk about decision making. That whole thing has to go. That's fucked up. Yeah. And it denies him part two of that <clears throat> because part two really is, well, how did it feel? And how did she feel? Did you guys talk about it? You know, yeah. like, do, like, what are you thinking about the, the sex you're going to have in the future? Um, what has she told you? Like, what, a, what do you feel like you're too afraid to say what do you want but you feel like you can't express you know different things like and so basically when we stop the the dialogue then the all that boys questions they evaporated into the air and who knows you know how that's going to affect him because and again i'm i'm not yeah. licensed in this way but i i remember that i remember being in high school and not having part two it was kind of like so i was raised catholic um right now i'm agnostic and i'm I don't know, maybe Baha'i someday, whatever. I'm interested in it, but I don't know. Baha'i? Um, Baha'i? Yeah, yeah. What's that? So it's like, a, it's about the progression of religion and using like every religion as the truth. So you sort of take what, and then you, in, within, as I understand it, again, I'm like super early in my learning, but you kind of dissect each religion and part of it is truth, like universal safety and wellness and goodness. And then the other part is propaganda. And a lot of that is like related to repressing women or homosexuals or fear mongering in terms of sex. And so anyway, I'm interested in it, but huh. we'll see. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I remember it was, so I was raised Catholic and I, in Catholic you have like, in, or excuse me, in Catholicism, you have the commandments and then you have like all these sins, right? Well, in health class, you only get the sins. Like, whereas I really think you should have commandments in sex. It's a practical way to be like, hey, so le leaning forward, you know, into the future and, you know, most of one. you are going to be Th sexual thou, beings. I got one. Uh, yeah. Thou shalt reciprocate oral. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, or like, and thou shalt um, remember to ask your partner how they are or listen to your partner, you know, different things that are like really important. So you don't, create bad behavior later on and you don't overly focus on well if i have sex i will get pregnant and die you know that right. dude from mean girls you know yeah the, the the analogy that just popped in my head is imagine if we live in a society where 95 percent of people will go rock climbing once a week and or, you know, twice a week or whatever like it's it's a right. regular part of this society we live in the himalayas yeah uh, 95% of people, we all just know. We all know it. They're all going to go rock climbing. But, but not in public. Like, 
Well, you can't have other people see you. Rock <laughs> yeah, who knows? Um, and you gotta be naked in the cold snow. <laughs> and, and we know that uh, we don't now. Kids don't go rock climbing. No, usually, but teenagers, you know, some start earlier, some start what? later, and they're they're into it naturally. And Jesus. Uh, you know, they don't go as high or as wide, but you know, they like to rock climb. And we yet do not train about how to decide no. what mountain to climb, how to uh, like remain safe. Put a rope safe. in correctly. Yeah, how to, put a, how to, how to uh, you know, take care of the people you're climbing with, what weather conditions. How to deal with it if it's like multiple people climbing at the same time. Right, exactly. <laughs> and how um, to deal with the fact that if you can't make it to that next peak, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how to deal with when like um, a, a, a seagull poops on your face and yeah, it's, right. it's like coming down <laughs> into your mouth. And, and, and you, have someone, <laughs> you have someone coming up from, from underneath you and they're coming up pretty fast. And then you're trying to get from the, there's someone in front of you and you're like trying to get past, like you got to deal with yeah, all this. And then there's the swingers who like to swing all <laughs> over the place. But anyway, you know, it, we would say that's absurd, right? We that's would say absurd. like, you can't just not <laughs> teach people because you're in denial that people are doing things. Everyone yeah. understands intellectually that teen, yeah. like a lot of teenagers are having sex uh, of some sort, maybe not in intercourse, but, right. but things they're doing stuff. But a lot of kids do have intercourse yeah. too. And we yet only talk about think we, our only message is wait and it will kill you. And I don't want you to do it. And you're impure. You're going to hell depending on your culture right. pocket. Uh, you're defiling yourself. Oh, and you're by defiling the way, yourself for your eventual, you know, spouse. Yeah. And, and you, you're a 17 year old, by the way, at a camp, trying to do a presentation for younger kids and talking to the teachers about what you're going to talk about. And now you've been shamed, told you better not talk about that. Shut that whole thing down. Oh, my, and how would that 17 year old feel? Yeah. Like, oh, maybe it is shameful. Yeah. Oh, geez. Now I feel bad. Well, uh, upon separating ourselves from the teachers, I turned to him and I said, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, people are uptight. Uh, do not generalize. Yeah. I, I just remember, and he was, and he was a very mature kid and he was like, yeah, I get it. Jeez, you know? And he, he was a very compliant, nice, yeah. nice kid. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really silly. Now there are sex educators out there who are uh, providing the, the good education. There are parents out there uh, like I said, teachers, school districts, they're rare. Um, you know, I was in preparation for this episode, I was looking at some of the research and one of the interesting points that some of the uh, experts uh, are pointing out is that in our mainstream American society, we depend on schools mm. to educate our kids <laughs> about sex. True. Parents, like you mentioned, you know, a lot of the parents are like, oh, thank God, oh, thank I, don't God. Have, I don't have to talk with my kids about sex. How effed up is that? It's <laughs> terrible. That we, we think public schools are going to do the full job that are required for right. our youth to understand sex, to make good choices, to not hurt other people, to know how to stand up to victimization, yeah. to know how to uh, ask for things, to know how to uh, navigate all that stuff. I mean, but so as soon as I read that, I was like, oh my God, we do That's do that. That's crazy. Yeah. Did you, know, you have sex ed, Colin, when you were young? I did, but it was technically only, it wasn't a sex ed class. It was health class. And there was a section where we talked about health uh, or excuse me, sex health. But again, it was all STDs and how to check yourself for testicular cancer. And the girls got similar treatment. We left the room. Um, and that was another thing that I, I sort of noticed is the narrative of uh, sex education in turn, I guess I only have my experience, right? But it was very much um, split in two. And now there's several problems with that because one, uh, probably the, the, uh, the statistics would support that the most people in my high school health class were heterosexual now, and most of them uh, identified by their cisgenders just because there's more, of those people in you know America than there are the minorities. Now, mind you, I would be very shocked. Well, I'm a, I'm an example of somebody where that was not the case. Um, being separated from the women in this case, it was sort of like they were they were making it very apparent that like there are things 
that you men, you cisgendered men, shouldn't know about. There's already that like this thing that feels so otherworldly because it feels like a, a byproduct of these old ages, like the Victorian age where women had their talking rooms and men had theirs. And I, I get it. I get that high school boys can be very silly. So can high school girls in their own way. But, and so when you show a woman, you know, a woman's naked body on screen checking herself for breast cancer and the men are seeing this, it, I, I do understand because people would make jokes. Just a uh, asterisk on that. That never happened um, with the kids that I worked with. They, there were, you know, a, maybe every three or four years there was a, a couple jokesters, but the vast majority of the kids were riveted. I mean, they were just like, yeah. their eyes were just wide with attention. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, uh, that's a paranoia that I think teachers don't need to worry about. Well, absolutely. And I think that I, again, like as I'm making assumptions here, that's something that I'm buying into. And I think people yeah. buy into it because it's, it's a way to stop us from having that conversation. And now that I'm thinking about it, I remember the, the scene where the guy is checking himself for testicular cancer. There's a flaccid penis right there on screen. And I was not out at the time, though I knew that that was something that I wanted to see. And so I remember the, what my brain did. I went into survival mode. I went into oh. don't have a reaction, focus, be oh. still. And I think that that's a part of it too is like, we're, we're not going to cahoot and, you know, cavolt. We're going to, most, most of us in that regard would feel like, oh, we better not react to things so as to, you know, elicit other reactions that are going to tell something about like our, our secrets, you know? And, and so I guess that that's, that's where I'm getting at is that there's this notion of secret sex that in my opinion has been perpetuated in young people. And that is, I think that's the root of a lot of problems because when you have secret sex and you can't talk about it with your parents, you can't talk about it with your friends, not in a real way, not in a way that's not like, Hey, guess what I did with this girl? Like you're going to make mistakes. Yeah, totally. And I was going to add that. Uh, in fact, I, I would be so okay with, so yeah, so a couple of boys or girls chuckled at this or that because that is actually part of the process you got to go through to like normalize mm -hmm. the whole thing. And, you know, and in fact, it's an opportunity for the teacher or maybe another student or whoever to say like, it's normal. Like we all have this, like, you know. Well, and it's normal to giggle because yeah. our society has, has yeah. decided to make it a little silly. It's right. fine to have a little giggle or a little laugh, it, that let's, but let's keep it, you know, respectful. So one of the reasons I thought the movie Kids was so important when it came out is because, and I remember the, rea read, like, I was younger, but like, I remember reading the reactions on newspapers and things as people were shocked. Oh my gosh, it's a horrible movie. It like, it depicts this horrible uh I hope this is not the reality of our youth today and stuff like well, this. Can you summarize the movie for those? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So kids, uh, Richard Linkletter, right? Um, it was this uh, movie about these, these uh, the, uh, the teenagers in New York City on a very hot day. And it's, um, they, it's just a day in the life, but it, it involves like their sexuality and it involves AIDS and it involves casual sex and it involves being irresponsible with sex, but it also involves the conversations that they have. And the thing that made it so gritty is it was filmed sort of not documentary style, but almost like documentary, a day in a life. The kids were allowed to talk the way they talk with each other. It wasn't really that scripted. Yeah. It was, it was kind of like, um, as if you were making a documentary with a secret, uh, a camera that was filming people and the kids were, I think they're like 15 or something, 13. Right. And, and they're also, they live in New York and, and they, they want to drink and they want to have sex, but they right. don't know what they're doing. And most of them were actual street skater, like park skaters. Yeah. Uh, they were not skateboarders. They weren't actually like actors and actresses. Some of them were, but, um, and anyways, I, the, the conversations they were having were like about blowjobs and about having sex and about like anal sex. And then they, the two of the girls went and got tested for AIDS and spoiler alert, one of them comes positive. It's, it's intense. Uh, I love the movie because it's just a, a great movie in that, in many ways, but I think it was also a very important movie because it unboxed this reality of like, Hey, guess what? 
kids are doing this stuff. Yeah. And to be clear, it's not Link Later. Oh, sorry. It's Larry Clark. And, oh, right. Larry Clark. And who sorry. I think did, did Gummo? Did they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Larry Clark. I just and uh, has Chloe Savigny and Ro- Rosario Dawson, a very, yeah. very young Chloe Savigny. Savigny? Savigny, and, I don't know. And uh, Rosario oh, da- Dawson. Uh, so, uh, yeah, right. Um, Larry Clark. Well, so, so tell me, Colin, what was it like growing up not out while a teen not only in sex ed class, but as sex is being talked about amongst your friends? Well, it formed in me as a kind of sexual deviancy, which I really wish that it hadn't. Um, And I'll try and um, elaborate. So it was something that I felt like led to behavior that was inappropriate. And because it made it a game, you know, I think some like, for gay men in the 60s, for example, or I guess any other time period, like you could not get married you, you know, to another man. Um, and, you know, if you're a gay woman, you couldn't get married to another, you know, lesbian. Um, so it became like, well, that's not an option for me. So I'll just fuck around, you know, I'll like, and it, beca- it becomes like the, uh, this fantasy of like this thing that's only sex because there's no possibility of merging sex and intimacy. And that's definitely what I ended up doing. And it also made me a liar. And I'll be frank, I don't have any shame about it now because I understand that it was a time in my life where I was less secure and I was also trying to survive in a world where I thought that I couldn't say these things. But I didn't like that I was lying to my parents because, and then it also... Like I have a super close relationship with women. My mom and my sister, they're, they have always been like the power in our family. I have two strong grandmothers, all my aunts, super close with all my important teachers, women. I have a strong connection with other females. And yet I was doing this terrible thing where I was dating girls in high school that I didn't care for. I cared for them on a friendship level, but I lied. I told them that I felt things for them that I didn't feel because I felt like it was a way to secure my place in the conversation. I could be in that sex ed classroom and I could watch the videos and it, it, but the truth is, is that I, I was not a part of the narrative and I felt like I was, I was being excluded. And so even now to this day, I feel like, um, intimacy and sex is still something that I really have to focus on as opposed to intimacy. And then over here I have sex. So yeah, it's, it's, and I, and I don't know if that's, I mean, I can't blame everything on that time in my life and who knows where the rest of it comes from, but I just don't think that queer people are invited into the conversation and there's not even the question of queer sex in sex ed, but that also comes into like, well, what do trans people do? Because there are nobody teaches like, okay, well, if you, if you are trans, if this is something that you indeed want to do, like, I think a lot of trans people, it takes a long time for them to feel like they can date. My best friend is trans. And I think for a long time, like people would just not know how to approach him online. You know, he would, he would message people and the conversation would either get weirdly fetishy about mm. fetishizing the fact that he's trans or they'd ask inappropriate questions about what his genitalia is and they wouldn't even understand. It's like get, you're given a, a big ball of something that you don't understand. It's a big ball of uncertainty. Mm. And uh, if we don't include people into the conversation, that's what it always will be until you suffer in trauma and get out of it later when you're an adult. Yeah, I'm sorry you went through that. I, I, it's interesting to hear your experience with that that you would be forced into lying and also forced into treating your sexuality and your intimacy as this dirty, hidden fantasy thing. Not that it couldn't be enjoyable, but it had to be relegated to, uh, you know, secret rendezvous, if you will. And even in your own mind, you'd, you'd have to have secret thoughts that you couldn't share with other people. And for those who don't know, Colin, you're in your late twenties, right? So this would have been Mm -hmm. in the late aughts. So it wasn't even that long ago. And and this is, you know, after Ellen (laughs) and after other kinds of things that we point to as like, uh, you know, progressing as a society, that's true. But uh, 
and so that I, I often somehow uh, sometimes sort of assume that high school kids today are sort of beyond that. But uh, hearing this, it's like, well, I used to think that in the late aughts too. And I suspect that right. high school kids are still um, suffering uh, quite a lot. You know, maybe in Seattle, it's, it's, it's a little better than other places. But, but anyway. It, well, actually, to, to that point, I just had a conversation recently with someone that uh, they were from this area. M many years ago, they moved to a different part of the country. And uh, their daughter came out as gay while they were there. And they literally had to move back here because the place they lived in, it was so bigoted. And they couldn't stay What do you there. mean? Like what, what, what were... Uh, they lived in a neighborhood and in an area where... Uh, people were very right wingers, maybe. But what they do to her, I mean. Oh, um, I I don't know all the details. It sounded like uh, they, they were they used um, what do you call slurs, it? slurs, and they were She was excluded from things, and you know. Yeah, but, yeah I mean that's awful. But, I mean, imagine how much it must have been that they literally had to move. Yeah. Well, it ruins friendships too. I mean, the the so I I had two best friends. It was like us against the world, you know, we would hop to each other's houses and spend the night. We'd play video games till all hours, um, annoying parents running around. We had this, this possibly troubling game. Now I don't exactly like the way that it's called, but it was called the dark children. It sounds weird, Whoa. but all we would do is like run around at night and like hide in different, it was like hide and go seek, but we'd play it in the neighborhood. Anyway, Whoa. Sounds yeah, awesome. it was fun. Uh, wait, it was I, great. It was great. As a, as a drama person, Colin, I hear a screenplay in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, uh, mental note. But anyway, yeah. So I ended up falling in love with one of them, and the other one. I remember him telling me when I ended up, you know, mentioning that I was gay to him. He said, "Well, that's fine, but if you start seeing, you know, the other person." we're not going to be able to stay friends. And I, that really hit me. Like, I still think about that sentence to this what? day. I don't, I don't understand. So, yeah. So you have a really good friend mm -hmm. and you tell him you're gay and you're like, I like this other guy. But it, it was our, so we had a core, all three of us were like best friends. Oh yeah. yeah. So I fell in love with triangle you know, vertice one and triangle vertice two said, well, if you get with triangle vertice A, then the whole triangle is broken up and we can't stay friends. I see. I see. And I, it why? Well, um, because he said that it would, um, I don't remember his exact words after that, but it was basically, he was trying to say that it would be, he didn't want to be like the straight person that was friends with the two gay guys that were dating. And, it, it really hurt me. And it, and I, and I still, and I don't actually, I don't have any anger towards the friend who said that. Um, I mostly have anger with myself because what I proceeded to do was break vertice A's heart because oh. they did this like super sweet thing where they reached out to me and told me, you know, I actually like in that high school way, like I'm in love with you too. And like, I want, and then I, I basically said, well, you know, the stuff that we're doing on our own is fine, but I don't think I love you, even though I was totally over head over heels. And then oh. the next day I proceeded to quote unquote, go out with one of my theater friends, one of my girl theater friends. And I like oh. got a girlfriend so as to salvage the relationship. And, and what I'm saying is like, there was no dialogue about like, sex might make you feel emotional way A. You might have, you know, a response, your friends might react to it in this way. And I just didn't have access to that. That's awful. That's were, were you friends with A and B after all that? No, I'm not friends with them anymore. I, um, I, well, B moved away, and like so, his um, his mom uh, had cancer, and his dad recently passed away. It, it was a huge, and she had it while we were friends. And so, his oh. mission in life, he was extremely driven. He was um, half Hispanic, half um, Greek. And he and they didn't have a lot of money, and his parents were first generation immigrants, and so he was very driven. And I really always admired how intelligent he was. And so now he's like a he's a cancer doctor right now. I do know that, but it's somewhere else, and we just took different paths. But, but B, I actually met up with later, and um, I tried. I really tried to make it work, but um, again, like 
when we act, and I still have like sexual trauma from this, um, and stop me if this ever goes too far or whatever. But, um, like when we did end up hooking up again, this oh, that's is now, too far. that's too far. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had graduated from high school. So had he, and it was a couple of years down the road, we met up again and we fold around and it wasn't great because all the intimacy had been sucked out of our relationship. And it was like, all we had was the narrative of shallow sex. And I knew that wasn't what I wanted, but I did it anyway. So I still mm -hmm. like, to this day have to fight, like no calling. Like if you aren't feeling the intimacy, like you don't have to do it to try and reclaim some kind of intimacy. But again, didn't have that narrative. So yeah. I didn't know what to do. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Definitely. But it, it's sort of like, so there's a moment that I think relates to this. There's two moments actually on the show. And I don't know quite how I feel about them. I'll, I'll throw them out there and then you can decide for yourselves. So in one moment, the, one of the characters who has a huge penis reveals himself to the entire auditorium. It's oh, met yeah, with the reaction. That. Yeah, it's met with this general like, okay, so people snicker, people laugh. But at the end of the day, there's, a, there's some kind of respect that comes from like, he's packing. He has a huge fucking porn star dick. And that's the narrative. Now yeah, that's, that's a classic that's a classic trope. You have like <laughs> the nerd or the the quiet guy and now all of a sudden it's like okay. Well, that guy, you know, can literally hang with me you now. You know? But they flipped it in a little bit in this one because this was like the this was the rebel kid. Oh. Who was kind of a dick, literally. Yeah. He was <laughs> like then, a bully. He's a bully. And then him showing himself was more a matter of like Almost like, yep, all the rumors are true. Live with it or something, you know? Oh, okay. Right. Uh, and he had and, a whole bunch of internalized uh, shame of his own and all these things. Is he the oh, main yeah, we're, guy we're in the him. first episode? Because well, like, Yeah, yeah. How it starts and he's having sex with a girl and the girl's like yeah. in pain a bit. <laughs> right. That's the guy. It's, it's sort of like the main three trio. Yeah. The, the cool guy, the cool girl, yes. and the, the sex therapy. Yeah. Guy. So it turns out yeah. in this case, the cool guy has the cool dick <laughs> yeah so anyway and then the narrative is flipped for the female because later this is season one episode five i think i would say it was my favorite of the first season my favorite episode where um one of the girls has a picture of her vagina leaked and one of her friends being ever so sweet uh decides to publish it send it out to everybody <laughs> everybody sees it um and so and it's used as a form of bullying yep. people spread rumors about whose vagina is this? Because it's whatever they talk about how like, it's like, it's not a pretty vagina. You know, yeah. all the mean things people say like that, that snatch is gross, you know, whatever. And so I, I started to think about how like, you know, young people, you know, depending on what parts you have, you have a certain access to pride or shame. And I felt yep. very like gendered, you know, and, and that, that kind yep. of. No, I agree. Like I, so you're right. So on the one hand, on the scene with the bully, and I don't know what their intention was exactly, you know, with the script and things like that. But you were right that there's this moment where it almost like, oh, yeah, actually, the most defining characteristic of this character is, in fact, that he's got a large dick. And then uh, with the vagina thing, uh, I guess that's more of a commentary about like how everyone's, especially the young ones, have all these misconceptions because of, you know, probably porn or, or media and stuff like, well, yeah, I mean, if. If you have, if you don't have like a picture photo perfect Instagram ready vagina, then what's wrong with you? Like, what yeah. is that? <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. I mean, it's a similar thing when it, an all body shaming, if a woman has a mustache, yeah. if a man has a unibrow, right. if uh, our skin isn't, you know, toned quite, or if we have freckles or if, you know, there, there's just... Oh, I'm going to denounce you here. I'm pointing. I, Jacques, uh, you, do you remember when we were in Vancouver and I took my t-shirt off and I had that little skin tag that wasn't actually that little bit on my back and you and Ron's skin tag shamed me. Like, what is that? And I actually ended up getting it removed because I felt such shame. Oh I never God. before cared until that moment. Thanks for, uh, saying this on the air, bro. Really, <laughs> now really to be helpful. fair, this was like 13 years ago or whatever, but 
it was a case where honestly, and it's a, it's a minor thing, but like before that I had been, that thing had been growing on me, that tumor that, uh, what was the one, uh, Quato or from the <laughs> total recall had been growing on me for probably five years or something. And then all of a sudden, and I hadn't really cared. I'm like, yeah, I've got a thing. And all of a sudden my two friends are like, what is that? That's so gross. Oh my God. So I was like, okay, shit, I got to go get this removed. But see, like, I think that if you had, and now I'm, I'll toss this to Kirk in just a little bit because it's merely an inference. I'm not making a statement based on credibility. I just think that like, if you had been given proper sex education, the most important thing that would have come from that is self-esteem. Oh, same with me. I thought you were going to say the most important thing that would have come out of that is you would have stroked Peridot's skin tag <laughs> instead of shaming it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'd be the second most important. Um, well, but first I, off, I, I apologize. That's awful. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, I can see me and Ron doing that, so it's not uh, that uh, uh, odd. Um, I would never have thought that you would have been hurt by that. I guess I, that, that's the thing. <laughs> I actually wasn't hurt. It was more that I was all of a sudden shame a uh, shame yeah yeah mm-hmm. and well, i was like well oh okay, maybe I shame potato it. potato i yeah uh i i wouldn't have said anything if i thought <laughs> but you know of course it makes sense that it would yeah. and you know i guess that's the purpose but you know that weekend alone, we probably made fun of each other yes, in all yes. sorts of a variety of ways. Now, now I will. I'm not excusing it. I'm right. just saying like. <laughs> now, I will say though, like one little asterisk, which is where but this gets really weird. I was much happier once I had it removed. So I did a good thing just, by so, shaming so, you. But, but it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a gray zone. <laughs> no, that's awful. I mean, this is exactly what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, if, yeah. You know, if I'm going to indict society on these things, then. Uh, sure. I, I can't lift myself off the hook. I mean, that, <laughs> that's truly awful. I could, you know, say it's uh, society did that to me, but I, I made that choice. I was a grown man. I was probably in my forties at that point. Uh, that's, uh, you know, it's not cool. And, at the and very we have least, to think about that. And we, and I wonder if, yeah. you know, fast forward, if you just put me 50 years from now, if that kind of comment would really feel like that's not really, that's going a little too far. Cause right. you know, there's certain jokes now that's true. that I like, there's certain, movies that I'll watch even just like <laughs> 10 years later and I'll be like, Oh, Whoa. that, that doesn't feel right anymore. Yeah. The thing is, I feel that based on my experience with that little skin tag, which by the way was like about the size of a pea. So it wasn't that little, but it was in the middle of my <laughs> back and stuff. But anyways, uh, if I saw someone else and, and they had that, I think what I would do it's someone I care about anyways, I would approach it differently. I would say, uh, because, you know, sometimes you might want to get these things checked out and stuff. I would say, hey, you know what? I actually, I had a little tag like that too. Uh, and in my case, I went and checked out because I wanted it to like make sure it wasn't like, you know, like malignant or something weird. Um, and then they, they actually just, it was an easy procedure and I was kind of fine. But I'm wondering, like, is that even, you know, because like that's a much more caring approach. And I'm even saying like, I had something like that too. But, you know, like at what point is it okay to say something? Yeah, I mean, to take it to an extreme, you know, I used to be attracted to men too. And I went to a hospital <laughs> and they changed me. You know what I mean? Uh, like, uh, but you got to be able to say something about something sometime. Yeah. Uh, it, well, if it's truly concerned, like I was worrying it was cancer, you might want to get that checked out. I, you know, that's obviously. Yeah. So, like if you, if you walk in and you have a huge lump in your, in your neck. But, but if you're just looking at an abnormality on someone's skin, you're be like, you know, you should probably go to the doctor and get that checked out. Uh, you know, it's, it depends. It depends. Yeah. I think it's more but, about the making but I, fun of, I, I wanna, <laughs> but I want to be, I, I want to ask you, uh, are you saying that if I had a skin tag on my back that weekend, <laughs> you would not have made fun of me with Ron? I wouldn't because I, and in fact, this is one of the things that I took, not offense. I was just guard, uh, on my defense when we did the fat shaming episode because the one that we did with Emily, not the follow up. Because I actually have never made fun of people for physical stuff, except as a self-defense to my best friends in junior high who were making fun of me. And we had like this little thing, but, but like, I was always like appalled when people did it and I was never, so no, I would have never shamed your skin tag. Okay. Uh, would you have made fun of me for every other thing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless of its uh, yes. impact on my shame. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes okay. Yes, I just yes. want to. Be well, but it, I think it, it, I think this is an important point though, because mm-hmm. so oh. if you, if you both were on the same, like, okay, so 
we're th- we're going to put like a little bit of a, we're going to go into a time machine. So we're like, now we're seeing Kirk in high school and now we're also, and so, and that's time machine A. I'm, I'm all about A and B today. And yeah. then B, we have t- <laughs> time machine B, we have Umberto. And sure. like now I'm, I don't know, y'all know each other far better and I don't know either of you as well, but I'm going to, I've heard from Kirk about your high school experience. Now you, you had stuff to struggle with, but you were like on the football team and you are part of like the masculine group. I heard that you wrestled and that you have pictures that you're definitely going to put on the Facebook page at some <laughs> point. Um, and Umberto, I haven't heard about it, but I would hazard a guess, guess that, that you were more like scholarly at least in high school you didn't do as many sports maybe that's not true but (laughs) so what i'm saying is if we don't create the narrative for you're on the swimming team right yeah i was cross country and swimming but it doesn't matter like okay so maybe that's true but i but i think that like we we fall back on like high schoolers fall back on superficial things the way that like and so then behavior perpetuates for years right because it's like i have the right to make fun because I was told that I'm like superior, you know, or I've internalized that I'm superior because high schoolers will decide on a hierarchy if we don't. And so there's a sexual hierarchy too. And so I just think that that's where like, ultimately, if you had been given equal footing to like make jokes and feel like you're like a part of that, Umberto, then like it would have been, it would have just rolled off. You know, you wouldn't have had that you know, reaction. I think you're getting some stuff right on. There are some subtleties here. Um, The thing is, I think the reason I never uh, and have never made fun of uh, sort of like disadvantages came from my dad. And it was just, um, he had a really, all his failings aside, he had a really strong sense of like right and wrong when it came to so- social justice and morality in that sense. And so I just remember mm-hmm. from the very earliest memories I have of just understanding that the person walking on the street that looks disheveled is not only not something that we should make fun of, but it's something we should, someone we should help. Right. And when my, when people would come over to the house that had like a speech impediment or, or were overweight or had any number of things that was never anything to make fun of, or even talk to like, it was always like, like if anything, uh, it was like interesting to meet all these people. Like, cause we had, we did, have, I had a lot of friends of the family or whatever, some of whom had this, that, or the other. And so I, and I had a cousin who was definitely on some autism spectrum or something. So I just grew up with that sense. That said, uh, look, I grew up around a lot of kids that had a lot of money and I didn't have money and I grew to resent that a bit, you know? So like I grew up with some resentments. And so like, I think I automatically resented and, probably would have made fun or said dismissive things about people with money. Right. And that's not necessarily fair in in that direction. So I think your point, your meta point is right. That whatever you grow up with does leave a mark. And if you grow up in a culture where you kind of do make fun of this, that, and the other thing, like that's just kind of like embedded with you. Yeah. I will admit that I grew up, I mean, to, to frame me as a football player is a very oversimplification. That's not what you're doing, Colin, but that's what I sometimes do. I was a dumb also, jock. How's that? <laughs> I, I was also in drama. I got no, exa- I didn't imply I didn't mean to imply that. I mean, I was literally yeah. singing in, in the talent shows uh, <laughs> with my baseball hat on. Uh, but primarily, Aww. but primarily I was a jock, you know, but, but anyway, I am a person of color and I did experience racism growing up, but yeah on average, you know, being male, being tall, being athletic, getting good grades, having a a good smile that was sort of fostered by my parents, being raised well, being, having parents that are together that don't use any substances, um, even to this day, really. And just having that security and the money and the, you know, just all that, uh, backing me up, uh, I, I did have an attitude of, I mean, superiority, but also unawareness of, mm. of how it would be to, to be sure. other kinds of people. Although, you know, obviously I did have shame and, and cause you know, everyone yeah, yeah, does, of but the amount was, was mitigated by my privilege. And, uh, there are distinct moments in my later life, teenage life, twenties life, thirties life, where I started to realize Mm. and scaling back my license to 
make fun of people, you know, yeah. uh, with an understanding of like, if you make fun of someone on that level, in fact, you know, I'll t- this is just another body shaming episode, I suppose, but I guess you could say it's sort of a privilege that I'm not balding. Okay. You know, I'm almost 50 years old. Right, right, right. I have a thick head of hair. There's right. uh, you do too, Berto. Yeah. Like you and I have, we'll probably never go bald, right? There are plenty of people who go bald early in life. Yeah. You know, I have friends who started to go bald when they were in high school. Right. And right. guy friends of mine. And, uh, you know, guys being guys, there's just no boundary to what you make fun of. And, and that's because you and I don't have enough testosterone. We're not manly enough. Yeah. And so uh, we would and I would. Uh, perhaps even more because I'm kind of a shit talker. Like uh, I come from a, a group of shit talkers where you pretty much all, you, you never let any of your friends feel good about themselves. Right. And I did too. <laughs> yeah. There's just like, there's no, there's just like, Oh, he feels good about himself. You right. got to tear him down. Right. And, and there's some good, there's pros and cons to that, I think on some level, but, but anyway, um, uh, I've had some friends who have, you know, started to go bald and, I will point it out, you know, during sometimes, you know, not right. relentlessly, but when it comes up, you know, it'll, it'll, when it seems to make sense to make a joke, I'll, yeah. I'll make that joke. I've never got a good reaction no. from the, from the no. guys. And, and, and in part, I've been trying to get, you know, my close friends that are balding to like lighten up about it. Like right. one, it's like, you're married, you have kids, you're almost 50. Like, what are you trying? You know, <laughs> the notion that you're still, somehow this strapping attractive guy like uh like plus it's like going bald doesn't mean you're not attractive right? Right. i mean it just means that uh you know you gotta always wear hats for the rest of just your bruce willis yeah right so so uh, to me the the there's just a uh, one final example of during my 40s realizing that oh i don't know what it's like right and uh i can't i have to be more sensitive to that. Um, right. I think I'm making a joke that's only, you know, on a scale from one to 10 is only like a two or a three yeah. but to them. It's like a nine. Yeah. And because I'm not going through it, that doesn't mean that I, I just have to ignore the fact that it's like really hard for some guys to, <laughs> to hear that, even yeah. though they know it, it's not like they don't know they're balding, <laughs> right. but, but they don't want to have it pointed out to them. Right. You know, there's, there's a line you don't cross, I guess. And I've noticed, okay, so I've noticed this, for example, uh, like I have a lot of white hair now and it started maybe a decade ago and at first it was a little bit, but dude, it is incredible what happens that where all of a sudden someone that means you well, likes you, you're friends with maybe even a family member and they see you and all of a sudden they're, they've done this to me. I've, this happened to me multiple times. Oh my God, you're going white or whatever. And of course, I'm like, being me, I'm, I always make some joke of it. But internally, I'm like, why would you say something like that? that? Don't you think I see myself in the mirror? Number one. Number two, I cannot imagine saying something like that to someone. Like seeing one of my friends being like, oh my God, you gained so much weight. Or like, what happened to your skin? But I think like, that's actually, again, from your dad. I, I think yeah. you're, the, you're the anomaly. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's weird. But anyways. Well, well, and it ties into, I think that um, we just need to, well, I don't know what we need to do, but I do sometimes feel myself um, internalizing that I'm less sexual or rather like I have less to offer in the gay community because of the toxic voices that are presented to us. And I'll, so again, there's so few voices of positivity and how to nurture your gay self when you're a young teen. And then you go into the gay world in your 20s um, or before, whenever, and you're walking through clubs and all of the images that you're given are holy fucking shit. Like this is a Channing Tatum level looking man, a uh, perfect <laughs> body. Traditionally, they're white or, you, you know, oftentimes they will be a, you know, very strong black man. Uh, it, it, but there's like there's not a lot of diversity. You don't see many Asian guys. You don't see guys with different body types. And so as me, you know, I walk into a club and I think, oh, well, this is the ideal. This is what mm-hmm. this is a person that has access to like people here. You you're welcome. Welcome into this space if you look like this. And oh. I think that that is like, you know, and I wish that like I had had more, you know, 
sexual positivity as a young person because I wouldn't be, I, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm inferencing again, but I think I would have less shame. Yeah. How do we engineer that? What, what's your recommendation to society? Well, I, I think that part of it is just like, so part of it ties into what happened to that girl in the show. Like, so all of a sudden when somebody else said that her vagina was ugly, then she thought, well, my vagina is ugly. And I think that a big thing that's missing is telling students that like they get to define, you know, how they see themselves. Your image is based on you. And a lot of times we don't do that because when you allow total access to identity, you get things like people dyeing their hair, people wearing jackets that don't have the correct logo, policing of gender normative uh, dress codes, you know, different things that are just like forced onto a child versus like, so if you could take, if this girl from the show who had her vagina plastered around the school and everyone was making fun of her, if she had been told and like had someone to dialogue with about like, how do you feel about yourself? Um, do you have str a strong connection with your vagina? Is your, how do you feel about vag your vagina? Have you looked at your vagina? Have you, do you like to pleasure yourself? Um, what do you think? Then it'd be less likely, I think, that, you know, she would think that, well, whatever somebody else wants to tell me about my vagina is true. So, if, and then for me, if I were to walk into that club, I would know that like, yes, I know, like I will never look like that guy. I might be able to get close if I worked harder or this, that, or the other, but that's not me. I am not Channing Tatum, but nor should I try to be. And I also have a place here. And that's, I think, what like is sort of missing because as, as long as we're not talking realistically about sex, we won't get to that part of the conversation. So I want to end the episode here with a few things that uh, I got to in my notes in terms of the research. It's a new trope, or it's been a trope, of the father goes into the kid's bedroom, oh. has to sit down, and, they, and yes. there's, there's actually funny American commercials. Pie. There's actually, yeah. And, <laughs> and the kid's like, God, dad, right. geez. And so there's this clear message that like attempting to talk to your kids about sex is totally unwelcome. It's a joke, right? You're incompetent, right? You're, you're, completely, you're completely awkward. You're completely out of touch. Yeah. You shouldn't do it. Kids don't want you. It's creepy. It's, it's, there's yes. something wrong with you. cool dads. Don't talk to their kids about, about right. Sex. It's the doofy dad in the movie that does that. Yeah. And they, they mess it up really badly. Yeah. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, like what? Um, because of the underlying foundation of ridiculousness our society right. has around sex, we are all 13 year olds and <laughs> operating as if we're adults when it comes to sexuality. That notion of like, did you say apparating? Like we're appearing out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> Tougher bluff, guys. In the U.S., 29% of men and 18% of women report clinical levels of distress caused by controlling their sexual urges. Tough. Uh, I'm going to go tough. Uh, it's bluff. 10% of men uh, and 7% of women. Okay. Uh, well, that's encouraging. I exaggerated. I mean, this is clinical levels yeah. of distress. Yeah, we're talking like <laughs> depression. So anxiety. 10 is really bad actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. Yeah. You know, one out of 10 people are experiencing that's crazy. essentially a form of mental illness because they have to suppress Jeez. their normal sexual urges. Yeah. Um, let's look at here. Another one. Tover Bluff. Today's teens are having sex earlier than teens in the 1970s. Tover Bluff. Bluff. Uh, what would you say? Bluff. Yeah, I'm going to go bluff. It's about the same. No, teens, oh. today, teens today are delaying sex oh. longer. Really? Yeah. The decline, mm. the decline was found across demographic groups, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic Man. status, and geographic reason, region. We have this narrative that kids are having sex earlier and earlier when in fact it's the opposite. Which is funny. I was trying to preempt that narrative and going like, yeah, I bet you that's the misconception. So no, it's about the same. It's even the wow. other. Right. Because one, I think we're actually doing good things. You know, yeah. our, our sex education and our society is definitely better than it was in the 70s right. when it comes to sexuality. I mean, right. we have a long way to go, but uh, as someone who grew up in the 70s, I'm here to tell you it was worse then. So, so there's that. Um, also, 
there is a a lot more effort on uh, sort of fostering longer childhoods for kids. Mm. Uh, in the seventies, basically when you hit 16, you were basically an adult, <laughs> you know, it was yeah. just like, you, you know, it wasn't unusual for parents to be like, yeah, he's drinking and driving and right. smoking and whatever. He's 16. And so that kind of tougher bluff, a recent study found that 53% of teenage and college boys report having an unwanted sexual experience. 43% of teenage oh and college boys report having an unwanted sexual experience, essentially that they were date raped or sexually. 40, no, that's got to be a bluff. What do you think? I man? will devil's advocate and go with tough. It's tough. No. Yeah. 43. Yeah. Uh, that it's Holy shocking. Crap. It's only shocking because it, it's never talked about, but like if you said the reverse, like, you know, 65% of teenage and college girls report having an unwanted sexual experience. You'd be like, Oh yeah, that sounds absolutely. About right. yeah. yeah. But, but somehow like it's hard for us to imagine that almost half of, you know, males by yeah. the time they're 20, 20 or 21 have had an unwanted sexual experience. I mean, have That's you had an, I yes. mean, you were, you yes. were raped as a child, yes. but as a teenager, did you have any unwanted sexual experience? Yes. Yeah. So it, but the narrative is not unwanted sexual experience. Right. It was, well, you know, sometimes you get in a bind and you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, like yeah. there's, a, we, we narrativize uh, for women too, but less so for women than for men. Uh, we just say, well, you know, things going to happen, but it's like, no, I, absolutely. It, it's terrible. I literally, I felt pressure to, this is going to sound, if, because of what you're talking about, this is going to sound ridiculous but i felt pressured to let this girl give me a blowjob that's not ridiculous it, it, right and it ruined our friendship and i felt terrible about it same study 35 percent uh said of the people who said they had an unwanted sexual experience 35 percent of those men said the unwanted sexual experience was with a male acquaintance so 35 with a male uh, 65 with a female Huh. I think that's bluff. Well, what, which direction do you think it is? I would say um, less men. Okay. I'm going to go with Colin on this one. Hey, you guys are right. Good. Uh, what percentage yeah. do you think it is, Colin? Mm, I don't know. Maybe 15, 20. Uh, it is 5% male. Oh. Yeah. So 95. I didn't want to go there. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I meant. 95% of yeah. the men, the yeah. young men who said they went through an unwanted sexual experience said that it was the aggressor was a female acquaintance. And I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to imply anything like women are doing it more. I just think that yeah. fewer gay men probably have had the opportunity to say that they were, you know, they were in this oh, situation. I well, see. it's just so much easier for society and maybe us as well to imagine that the aggressor has got to be a guy. It's got to be a guy. Always right. guys. Yeah, yeah. Women, women are aggressors. Right. And it's, it's like, uh, yes, they are. Yeah, yeah. Holy crap. Yes. yes, they can be. Yeah. Tougher bluff. Talking about sex with parents is not associated with safer sex among adolescents. Bluff. Yeah. Bluff. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that's pretty obvious. Yeah. Uh, and another teen, teen girls experience 15% decrease in peer acceptance for having sex. Oh man. I'm going to go bluff. It's 25%. I, I would say tough. It's bluff. It's 45%. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Even so, I was too. Naive. So I don't know exactly how they measured that, but if I understand That's crazy. the study that they were like, how many of your peers accept you or something? Um, or would you accept your friend if they had sex? In? Ah, but this makes sense. See, because the percentage of guys that reported that they were forced to do something against their will and the percentage of girls is about the same, which means these girls are doing stuff to boys. So wait, I, I don't understand. So are you saying that the, this percentage was based on women who had sex, consensual sex, and then yeah. were less respected? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So, so, okay. so teen girls, so just, you know, if they had sex, they experienced by this metric in this study, oh, a 45% so decrease bad. in that peer sucks. acceptance just because they had sex. Yeah. Let's look at boys. Teen boys experience an 
increase oh my God. in peer acceptance for oh having God. had sex. Brutal. I think that's tough. Uh, no, it's bluff. It's like 99%. No, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. So opposite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and this is science. This isn't just anecdote. Yeah. Um, tough or bluff. Gay and bisexual youth who are supported by their families are more likely to have high-risk sex. Come on. No. Bluff. Bluff. Right. Uh, it's true. It's they're less likely yeah, yeah, yeah. to have yeah. high risk yeah. sex. Again, the stereotype to people who don't know better, uh, unlike the two of you, is that, well, if you accept your child's gay lifestyle, they're going to go crazy. Yeah. Uh, tougher bluff. Contrary to parental warnings, sexting does not appear to be a precursor to sexual behavior among teens. Oh, so sexting. Would you- Would you read that one again? Yeah. Contrary to parental warnings, sexting does not appear to cause sexual behavior among teens. Bluff. Bluff, he says. He's saying bluff. I mean, I would want it. I would want the surprise, but I am going to say bluff. It's got to indicate something. True. It's bluff. Sexting appears to be a precursor to sexual behavior among teens. Good, good, good. Uh, same study, uh, tougher bluff. The researchers also found sexting to be linked with later risky sexual behaviors. Oh, risky. I think that's a bluff. You, yeah, I'm going to go bluff. Wow, I can't get any over on you. It's bluff. But I will say that the previous one was really well done because it yeah. was just the kind of question that would maybe surprise us. <laughs> yeah. Sexting, <laughs> sexting is not linked with risky sexual behaviors. Good. So it is linked with sex, but not yep. risky right. sex. So if your teen is sexting, all that indicates is that they're having sex. It does yeah. not indicate they're on, on average yeah. in danger of something. In fact, I wonder if it, there's some sort of like preamble aspect to it that, that helps because you're like, you know, you're show, showing some intent, you know, you're showing some consent in some ways that you want to take it to a new level and you're sort of, you know, sniffing each other out, so to speak. Yeah, it's hard to know. It's good speculation. Uh, Akin to that, you could say that maybe it's that if you are non-shameful enough to have it be a little uh, public-ish, that you have enough non-body shame or enough openness about sexual communication Uh, because you know, the classic sexting example is like, uh, a picture of your junk, for yeah. example, but, mm-hmm. uh, sexting, uh, on average is not that it's, yeah. um, it's, it's, it could be like your nipple, for example, just joking. It's, <laughs> it's like, Hey, let's do it later. Yeah. Or, um, or I had you, a dream about you. Last what night. are you wearing or something? Or, well, you know, it should be a part of the narrative too, right? Like with anything, it, we should teach them how to feel safe about it. Like, and also the risks, you know, like, Hey, if you like know what you're sending, you know, you're, you're letting go of some of your agency, but also it, you know, there are times where you can feel trust with a person and like, should you ask for one back? Um, what are, you know, when do you not send? Cause that's another thing. Like people will start, start sending unsolicited naked pictures and that becomes a huge problem that could be qualified, I think is abuse. So. I, I'm also, I believe that you are not actually, it's not legal to send uh, naked pictures from anyone under 18. So like, yeah, it, it the laws ha- are evolving uh, because the original law was, you know, yeah. uh, por- child pornography. Yeah. So yeah. you could be 17.9 years old. Yeah. And if you send a picture of yourself to your, also 17 year old boyfriend yeah. naked, then that's technically child porn because you're yeah. trafficking in the, in the naked images of a child. Yeah. Uh, the laws and the enforcement of the laws are, are varied. And I'm, and I think that some of them have changed to kind of make a nuance for like, well, we don't want to prosecute that individual the same way we prosecute yeah. someone who's trafficking and, you know, in images of five year olds yeah. that, that they took themselves. Um, I want to conclude with just a discussion about Big Mouth because I'm sure some of the listeners are like, why aren't you guys talking about Big Mouth? <laughs> uh, Berto, have you seen the show? Yes, yes. Uh, Colin, what do you think of the show? I absolutely love it. I think it's hilarious and informative. And you can. I, I think the fact that all of the children are voiced by adult people, uh, I think that's an ingenious way to just create a sense that you can watch it. You know, you don't have to feel weird in watching it because 
it's very clear that this is older generation, an older generation uh, going back and thinking about the times that they were in that grade. And and it it doesn't it also like distills the um, the thing that sometimes happens where it's like I was watching Riverdale with my friend the other day just because it's such a fun show to just like laugh at with a couple of beers in your hand. But um, there, it's very clear that it's written by somebody older that is not in high school. And so the fact that they, there's, they distill that, they're not trying, you know, in order to, to create like the realistic portrait of these middle schoolers, uh, I think that helps with the storytelling. And I, I'll say Mulvaney is a great voice actor. And when someone else writes his comedy, he's funny. Yeah, well, him <laughs> yeah. and him and Kroll, uh, Oh, a lot of, of a lot of collaboration on that. Yeah. It's mainly Curl's show. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I was hooked for, I don't know, five or 10 episodes. They're short episodes. Yeah. And they're pretty fun. Uh, and yeah, it's a great show. If you haven't seen it, it's, a, it's about the tween years and yeah. about sexuality and it, and it tries to, uh, you know, see it from all angles. Yep. Similar, to, I guess, to the way sex education does. Right. Um, yeah, I would say better. I, I think that there, it's better because the there's an there's something that's missing from Big Mouth that's in sex education, and I'll I'll say first by using uh, sex education as the example of having it, there is this element of the students being attractive. Like they cast a lot of right. actors who are very like fi- visually stimulating. Like there's this one scene where uh, one of the actors like he legitimately like pulls down his pants. And he like reveals his ass to the camera. He's like having bottom uh, anxiety. Like he's not sure if he wants to for his boyfriend, but like I'm watching it and I'm like, I know that this actor is like 20 something. He's playing a high schooler. Um, but like, I like, I'm attracted to this person. Like I'm attracted to this right. image and that's not what the show is. I don't think supposed to be about and versus like big mouth. You're not attracted to, you know, but, you know, if you see like an ass, because like there's this one character, Jay, that's like always getting naked. He's like, <laughs> he like, he basically like, uh, he, he what, would, what would we say? He developed early. So he's yes. like always having sex with his pillows and he's really proud of his penis. And like, there's this little, you know, middle school boy and you see his private parts. So you see other private parts of these little animations, but one, it's animation. And it's just, mm-hmm. there's no moment where you think that you're being asked to ogle these right. children. You know what I mean? And that's really what I think drives home, that it's just about understanding the uncomfortable aspects of sex. Yeah, Yeah. so I hope that with these uh, movements in our society, with these TV shows, because you just got to wonder, for a 13-year-old that might be watching Big Mouth, yeah. how is that going to affect them? With those in-depth, interesting, funny stories, with uh, good role models, with like examples of like, hey, shame is bad, uh, and self-esteem and body self-esteem is something to strive for. You're okay. It's right. okay to be who you are. It's okay to hit puberty later, although we understand that it, you have some anxiety about that. Um, it you just gotta wonder and hope that those kids will grow up and experience less of that horribleness. Right. Um, hearing you, Colin, talk mm-hmm. about your teenage years, uh, on one level, it's uh, an advancement from the 80s in that you at least knew you were gay and were okay with at least some part of your mind right. and were able to even uh, have you know at least the discussion of relationships with other boys. Uh, but still feeling that horribleness from society and that oppression and that uh, fear of, of coming out and, and then having your friend and the, the, the fear he had about being the friend of two gay guys, Ugh. you know, it just breaks my heart. And it, it's, you know, on one hand, it's like, okay, we've come a long way, but man, do we have a long way to go. And so for the kids today, uh, maybe it'll be different. I do think uh, that we have to completely rework our approach from a public health level because we can't depend on parents no. because, because they were raised in the same stupid system as everyone else was, right? So they, their information, you know, how many parents are uh, sex positive? How many parents understand 
um, their own sexuality. So we can't depend on parents. We have to completely rework this. And the only way you can do it is through public health. Schools, you know, might be involved for sure, but we can't lay it on the health teacher. Yeah. Um, I've met these health teachers. Some of these people are the most repressed, yeah. nerdy, uh, <laughs> inexperienced people on the planet. And they're the ones leading our children and their sexual lives. And dude, like most of the people in charge of our country are 60, in their 60s and 70s and they're white males, you know. And the, yep. notion, and the notion that to discuss sex leads to, you know, going to hell or immediately to pregnancies right. or to terrible, you know, STIs. We didn't even get to STI shame, which is a whole other thing. What um, usually are their credentials, Kirk? I, I, because I'm thinking back at my health teacher and I don't want to shame this guy, but I'm pretty damn sure he was just like the coach that was yeah. in the room at the time. I, right. I don't think he was a specific health teacher. I would love to know if he, what classes he took. You know? so, so public schools in different districts have different requirements and they over the years have gotten more robust just because mm -hmm. uh, teachers tend to be more educated as time goes on. But, uh, but yeah, when I was going to high school, our health teacher was, he was my football coach. <laughs> my, the uh -huh. head football coach <laughs> was the health teacher. <laughs> the think about this, the message that that sends. Okay. <laughs> the head of the manliest sport in the school yeah. is going to yeah. tell you about sex. By the way, I believe was accused and you know, called out as having a sexual relationship with a female student, by the way. Oh, whoa. Yeah. So, so the requirements are obviously not regulated at the very least and uh, can have some wonky results. Not to say that there aren't health teachers out there who are more than qualified right. to do this right. and, and have a, a sex positive attitude because that can happen. But we can't just randomly hope that that's going to happen, particularly in communities where literally no one in that community has sex positive influence. Yeah. And so we as a country, if we're going to solve, if we're going to reduce STIs, if we're going to reduce unwanted pregnancies, if we're going to increase our sexual uh, well-being, if we're going to increase our relationship well-being, we're going to increase our attachment well-being, we're going to decrease suicidality, decrease anxiety, decrease depression, decrease uh, uh, addiction to porn and other kinds of things. Substance use is sometimes turned to as a way of trying to deal with all this shame and horribleness. You know, there's a lot of social ills that come from a lot of things, including our, uh, our societal approach to sex. And the only way you're going to be able to change that if there's a massive movement and we have movements, there's pockets, but the government has to be involved in that. And we have other societies where that's true. We just have to look, you know, United States is one of the most sexual repressed societies in the world. <laughs> you look to other societies empirically, uh, they have a lot fewer problems. Yeah. Why? Because the attitude is different. They come from a different uh, cultural, historical uh, tradition that just allowed them to go down the road faster. Yeah. They involve the government. They have a better way of approaching it. Kids are having sex. Teenagers are having sex just like they are in the United States. But they have a way of talking about it. They have easy access to contraception. They're not uh, generally as ashamed. Um, you know, I'm talking about like Scandinavia yeah, and other right. kinds of countries. Um, and it's uh, a thing that we can do as a yeah. society. And it's obvious. It's science. Uh, anybody in sexual, uh, the sexual field will, you know, say amen to all this and have, you know, better recommendations that, than what I'm saying because it, it's their job to have those sorts of things. And yet we'll never do it because we live in a stupid fucking society that doesn't do anything about anything. Ah, yeah. And with that note. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that there's, um, it just comes back to fear and I, I don't know where like it started, but there's just a fear of sex and like even, and there's a shame around, we've talked about shame so much, but like even recently, like moving on from teen sexuality, like, adult sexuality is fucked up because there was so much and I, I really just I was gonna throw up if I clicked on any of them but I saw things that people were like posting or articles that were in response to what people posted about the halftime show because there wasn't there was sexuality mm, there were right. women you know that were doing certain things and these bigoted people were you know having this intense negative reaction to them and because, because dude, you know but, but it's understandable because you gotta you gotta get the the wavelengths 
of the few set of photons that hit our retinas during that thing were of a different color than some of the other wavelengths. It's so funny oh. because it was like, I, I saw the halftime show. It was not sexual at all. <laughs> no! <laughs> it was like dancing. And, yes. and like, like, I guess there were... You could see part of their butt cheeks. I mean... Oh my God. It was... There are so many... Yeah, yeah, it was... <laughs> Yeah, so we have a problem. We just need more shiny material to cover those butt cheeks. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, then bringing up Riverdale again, like, I'm tired of... What like, is Riverdale? Is I don't Riverdale? know what Riverdale is. Riverdale. It's a, my wife watches it. It's a terrible show. It's Whenever bad, I geez. come around the corner and she's watching it, she's like, you don't want to come in here. <laughs> is this the new Beverly Hills 90210? Yeah, essentially. Okay. But yes. it's, it's kind of... It's, isn't it based on Archie? Uh, yeah, it know. is based on Archie Pop comics. Oh, is it? Yeah, it has yeah. like oh. all the characters. Oh, but Betty and Veronica and Jughead. Sounds awesome. Yep. But it's darker. Ooh, it's are you about selling murder. me on this? Yeah. Oh, and then, so it's, but it's like, okay, so Riverdale is, it perpetuates the idea that like, it's, it's not the real sex. It's like mo shows like Big Mouth and sex education to a lesser extent. They're trying to create the true narrative or find some kind of truth, but like, Riverdale will have all these like perfect looking people, you know, who are in high school that don't look like they're Ooh. in high school and they're having sex, but they do these, this like, it's the language of cinema. I tell you that creates the negative stereotype that sex is okay to a point, but we don't know. We don't want to know what to do when it's actually time to have it because you'll have like Archie and Veronica and they're making out and you're like, Archie will lose his shirt. Veronica will like take off a jacket. They'll be making out. It'll get super hot. And then it cuts and then like, yeah. we'll see like, and then we'll see like Veronica and Archie naked, but like the sheet covers everything. Right, you don't right. see any boobs. You don't see any, you know, anything. And there's no, like, they're always like laying in a very sweet position where it's not implied that he's like touching her in an inappropriate place or like, you know, it's always like spooning moment where it's like his hand is on her hand. And yet it's like, that's not okay either. Because Dude, I'm going to get some popcorn and uh, some sodas. I'm going to come over. We're going to marathon this stuff, Colin. You guys okay. have sold me on it. So, <laughs> people out there, what do you think? You have to have a thought about this. So, uh, comment below. If you want to contact me or Berto or Colin directly, you can email us by going to the website, psychologyinseattle.com, filling out the Contact Us page. That's, that's really the only place that you're guaranteed to actually contact us. But what are your thoughts? Um, women out there, uh, we'd love to hear your opinions. We, yes. We, you have been a, a, a silent voice in this. I'm sure there are many things that uh, as, a, as a woman you could comment on that we didn't get to or that we uh, made a mistake on or something. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Colin, thanks for suggesting this. There's so much we could be talking about, honestly. Right. I think we just scratched the surface. It's an infinite topic. Uh, but yeah. everyone, you know, take a deep breath. Don't shame people's skin tags. <laughs> uh, seriously, you know, uh, if there, if there's one thing you can do to actually make the world a better place in this way, you can actually think about the sort of jokes that you either say or laugh at as a way of evaluating how you might be completely innocently and inadvertently perpetuating the kinds of sexual shaming that mm. uh, we do all to each other. Uh, that little bit is, is advocacy. That little bit is social justice that you're participating in. If you want to do more, uh, vote for people who actually make this a part of their agenda. If you want to do more to that, talk to your schools about, you know, okay, what exactly are you teaching my kids about right. sexual health? Are you talking about sex positivity? Are you talking about how to make decisions? Are you, are you only talking about abstinence only? Because a lot of people, a lot of you listeners out there in the United States, particularly in some of the red states, that's, that's the only way your kids are being taught. That's the only thing they're being taught is abstinence yeah. only, which empirically is harmful to kids. Yep. It's harmful. More teenage pregnancy, more STI, more depression, more rape, more horribleness. Ugh. So you, why would you allow your school to harm your child? At the very least, when they come home, put it all in perspective for them. Yeah. And so that's social justice. That's advocacy. Do all those things and please take care of yourself. Uh, Colin, why should people take care of themselves? Because they deserve it and the orgasm that they want. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>